Additionally, it's my honor to introduce today's keynote speaker. Dr. Fred Van Dyke is the executive director of the Ossobel Institute of Environmental Studies. This is a Christian Institute of Environmental Studies that has four campuses worldwide. It also um, works with 61 colleges and universities around the country to <clears throat> really offer classes and to teach um, students how to serve and protect God's earth. Before becoming executive director, Dr. Van Dyke was the former chair of the biology department at Wheaton College. He also directed the environmental studies program there as well. And before that, he directed the environmental science program at Northwestern College in Iowa. He earned his PhD here in New York at SUNY Syracuse in environmental and forest biology. He's authored numerous articles and books within chapters and also several books themselves, the most recent being Between Heaven and Earth, Christian Perspectives on Environmental Protection in 2010. It's such a pleasure to have Dr. Van Dyke here with us today. He's giving several lectures in addition to today's chapel. He's also leading a lunch discussion to follow this chapel in the Ellen Stowe Room. As also as part of our cultural enrichment series, he's giving a 4 p.m. lecture in Smith Science Center in the auditorium. And there's also a dinner discussion to follow that for any students interested from 5.30 to 6.30 in the Ellen Stowe Room. Please come and join us for that discussion. And then his final lecture of the day will be at 7.30 back in the Smith Science Center Auditorium. But please join me in welcoming Dr. Van Dyke today for this symposium. <laughs> Thank you for that kind introduction, that warm welcome. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. I have to admit that the shadow of the approaching storm gives, at least to me, a certain weight to my words, knowing that any one of them might be my last <laughs> before the planned power outage. But by God's gracious provision, we will see how much he permits me to say. And this word I bring you I intend to be a blessing to you. The title of my message, Caring for the Earth, is set before you as a statement. But before you can make a statement about caring for the Earth, you have to ask the question, should we care for the Earth? And to answer that question, you have to answer four questions, each in their proper order. First, does the Earth have value in and of itself? Is it worth caring about? Or are only the human beings who live on the earth worth caring about? Second, do human beings have the capacity to care for the earth? Do they have the actual endowments of skill, intelligence, ability, emotional makeup, to really do this, because there is no other species on the earth that cares for the earth. Can we really make the case that human beings are that different from everything else? Third, do humans have the authority to care for the earth? What gives us the right to meddle and to manage the affairs of species, landscape processes, ecosystem functions, if we have no real authority to act for good, then our actions are expressions of power and presumption. They are not actions of care. And finally, is there any hope for the Earth that would cause our care for the Earth to make sense. If endangered species are, in the long run, doomed relics of environments past, why make the effort to save them today if you can't change their fate tomorrow? If we open the Bible to find these answers, we must open it with caution. People don't always use caution when opening their Bibles. Often they simply open them to use their favorite lens to read it. And so in an age today that celebrates nothing so much as personal autonomy, we have, among other versions, a feminist Bible, 
an African-American Jubilee Bible, and yes, we now have a green Bible. A green Bible that its publisher promises, in his words, will equip and encourage you to see God's vision for creation and help you engage in the work of healing and sustaining it. I'm sure that all these efforts are well intended. I believe that all of them, including the Green Bible, are dangerously misdirected. Because none of these lens, including the green one, accurately reflect the intention of the Bible's author. In approaching the Bible and doing that with caution, we must remember that the Bible is above all a revelation of God by God. He is both the author and the subject. His purpose in writing and revealing is that we should know what he is like and who we are in relation to him. To read the Bible or try to understand the Bible with any other aim is to fundamentally distort its purpose and deviously misrepresent its author. Now, for a Christian environmentalist like me, these are very important reminders. I do not bring you today a green Bible. I begin these applications to myself and then I extend them to you. But the interesting thing is when we pick up the old, ordinary, regular Bible, and when we accept the Bible's understanding of itself, which is to say God's understanding of his own word, we discover that God does in fact have some very important things to say about us caring for the earth. In fact, in making statements about himself and our relationship to him, he gets to the point very quickly. Indeed, he answers the first great question immediately. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good. These are the first words of the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, Genesis 1, 1 through 4. If you keep reading, you'll read of the great and mighty creative acts of God, and over and over again, six times in the first 25 verses, you will hear the word of this revelation say, God saw that it was good. In every case, for every created thing, God looks at what he has made and sees that it is good. And this is the answer to the first great question. Does the earth have a good of its own? an intrinsic goodness or value unique to itself? And the biblical answer is yes, it does. Now someone might say, how do we know this goodness is an intrinsic goodness? Not just a way of saying that created things are good for us. Well, we know this is an intrinsic goodness in among other ways and that these statements are made in a particular context, a context of human non-existence. They are made before human beings are created. And after human beings are created, God does not ask them to make any assessment or offer any opinion or judgment on what he has made. The ancient rabbinical scholars of the Jewish Talmud expressed the meaning and the purpose of this text powerfully when they wrote, our masters taught Man was created on the eve of the Sabbath, and for what reason? So that, in case his heart grew proud, one might say to him, even the gnat was in creation before you were there. These words provide a moral norm, that the non-human creation is good, and that moral norm demands a moral response because human beings are not disconnected from this goodness. They share it with other creatures for they too are pronounced good. And their first task, it would not be unfair to say their first mission 
is to actively uphold that goodness. The Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to serve it and protect it. These are the words of Genesis 2.15. You might be more familiar with hearing or reading the verbs as till and keep. In Hebrew, the verbs are abad and shamar. The first is almost always translated, wherever it is used elsewhere in Scripture, as serve. As in Joshua's famous speech to the elders of Israel, which uses the same root, choose for yourselves this day whom you will abad. But as for me and my house, we will abad the Lord. And the second is shamar, which you will find among other places in number six, where God tells Moses to tell Aaron to tell the people, the Lord bless you and shamar you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. And in this command, nature's value is affirmed again. God considers his creation valuable enough that it is a worthy object of human attention and human care. Now the second question. Do humans possess a capacity to care for the earth? To see this capacity at work, let me show you a picture. Here are three individuals all engaged in a common task. They've been opening a termite mound and learning how to get the termites out so that they can eat them. And as you look at the three interactants here, know that all three of them are very intelligent. And all three, as you can see, are fully engaged in studying this problem, as the picture shows. In fact, as we look at the picture, some faculty here might be wishing their students in the 8 o'clock class were so fully engaged. But nevertheless, as they say, or they used to sing on Sesame Street, one of these things is not like the other, two of these things are kind of the same. If you guess which thing is not like the other, I'll tell you if it is so. Okay, that's all for the singing for today. <laughs> now the interactants here are Betty, who has her back to the camera, and Sirius, whose full face we can see, and Weewick in profile in the red bandana. Betty and Sirius are young female orangutans who have been raised in an orangutan orphanage because their mothers, like many orangutans, were killed when they were infants and they were captured and sold as pets. But they have been, if we dare use the biblical word, redeemed by a conservation organization and are now learning skills that will permit them to return to the wild and lead a normal orangutan life. Betty and Sirius are smart. They can add, subtract, multiply, divide. They can use computers. They could probably be admitted to some colleges. But for all their ability, it is Weewick who can do something that Betty and Sirius cannot do and that no other species on Earth can do. And to do this work, Weewick must consciously place herself in the feet of an orangutan, they don't wear shoes. She must try to see the world the way Betty and Sirius see it. She must understand what they need and how they can learn to get what they need. Weewick must take on a role the psychologist might describe as a reflective interactant. In doing this, Weewick is demonstrating the capacity described in Genesis 1.26. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Now the word image here would have been understood by its first readers not to be something that reflects a physical likeness in appearance, but a representation of another in physical form or presence. In making human beings in his image, God is making them representative of his presence and of his intentions toward creation. For God is a reflective interactant. 
toward every creature, expressing his love for it in a way that the great medieval scholar of the church, Thomas Aquinas, explained very clearly. God, said Aquinas, loves all existing things, for all existing things, insofar as they exist, are good. Since the existence of a thing is itself a good, and likewise whatever perfection it possesses. Now, I have shown previously that God's will is the cause of all things. It must needs be, therefore, that a thing has existence, or any kind of good, only inasmuch as it is willed by God. To every existing thing, then, God wills some good. Hence, since to love anything is nothing else than to will good to that thing, Notice what a very Christian idea of love Aquinas has. It is manifest that God loves everything that exists. Jesus says the same. Look at the birds of the air, that they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? Humans are worth more in terms of their moral significance precisely because they bear the image of God. They can choose to do and to create good because they have the capacity, as no other creature does, as image bearers of God to understand and to meet the needs of creatures other than themselves and different from themselves. No other species worries about the fate of other species because no other species has the capacity to do this. Humans alone possess it because humans alone are made in the image of God and in that image bearing lies their capacity to care for creation. And that brings us to the third question. Even if humans have the capacity to care for creation, for the earth, do they have the authority to do so? Now, this is a kind of what gives you the right question. Again, the scripture is direct. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I'll be straight with you here. Conservationists have trouble with this verse. It seems to them to provide a license to do whatever we want to creation because we are given by God not only authority but power. And there is no species that stands in our way. We have trouble with the word rule. We have an idea, a connotation, an association of ruling that we have formed from life experience and historical record of rulers. Almost all of it has been bad. So we have a problem with the statement because our connotation of ruling is not the same as God's definition of ruling. God does not rule the world as a tyrant, but he knows that human beings often do. To understand that, Let me introduce you quickly to a form of argument. You probably already know it well. A tautology. The simplest form of a tautology, an argument in which if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true, might be something like this. Premise one, A equals B. Premise two, B equals C. Guess you know where we're going here. Conclusion, A equals C. Now, Jesus instructs us in a tautology of ruling as well. You may remember the occasion. A fight breaks out because James and John have had their mother secretly ask Jesus if her sons can sit in the most privileged seats of authority in the kingdom of heaven. And when the other disciples get wind of this plot, they are not about to be the ones being ruled by James and John. Jesus puts a stop to the outburst with these words. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, 
and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to be great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. And if we understand Jesus' words, that they are in fact God's definition of ruling, we can understand this tautology very well. Human beings are rulers of creation. Rulers serve those whom they rule. Therefore, humans are to rule creation by serving its interest. And when we understand this tautology, Genesis 2.15 makes perfect sense. Not that we should be surprised that God's word is seamless in logical consistency. But God has given us unique capacity and coupled it with unique authority to represent him to creation through a rule of service and protection. And now we have answered every question but one. And that is the question of hope. Does nature have a future in the kingdom of God? Does it have a future that makes its care worthwhile? The vision of this hope begins to rise in prophecies of the Old Testament, like the one you know from Isaiah 11. The wolf will dwell with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the, of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, whatever else theologians and biblical scholars might say about this prophecy, if Isaiah's words are to be proven true, then these creatures must be present when the kingdom of God comes. Like they used to say at those old community raffles, you must be present to win. In this case, you must be present to experience redemption. Now, someone might say that Isaiah is speaking only here in a metaphor. But if it's a metaphor, it's a metaphor that is rendered theologically precise and very concrete by Paul when he writes to the church at Rome, for the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free into the freedom of the glory of the children of God, for we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Paul is not finished explaining this, for he sees the work of Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, not merely as a pathway for human beings to have access to God, but for the entire universe, the whole created order to be reconciled to God. And that is what he tells the church at Colossae, by him, Jesus, all things were created. In the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him, to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. If you were listening attentively, you might have noticed a recurring two-word phrase repeated three times in Paul's doxology and praise of Jesus Christ. In English, it's translated each time as all things. And that's correct because in Greek, it's always the same two-word phrase, tapanta. And Paul's logic is this. First, he asserts that Jesus Christ created all things. That's not a new idea. See John 1. Then he says, 
that Jesus as God sustains or holds all things together. That's not new either. See Psalm 104. Then, says Paul, the all things that Jesus created and holds together are the same all things, the very same all things he reconciles through, in Paul's words, the blood of his cross. Historically, evangelical Christians have displayed a bad habit of separating the doctrines of creation and the doctrines of redemption. Usually they talk about the first when they want to contrast creation with evolution. And they talk about the second when they are in fact speaking of personal salvation. Paul does not do this. He combines and unites here the doctrines of creation and redemption, or more precisely, he claims that they have been united and combined in Jesus Christ, who as the creator of the universe became incarnate in it, and through his death and resurrection redeemed and reconciled every created thing to the person, purpose, and intention of God the Father. And the answer to our question of hope for creation finds its conclusion here. And this does make a difference. To my fellows and colleagues engaged in conservation biology, in the words of 30 of the world's most famous conservation biologists who wrote to their fellow conservation biologists about the hope that this gives them in their work and published it in the pages of conservation biology, the discipline's leading scientific journal. Every time we celebrate a conservation success story, such as the recovery of the white rhinoceros in southern Africa, we are strengthened in this present hope that God is working with us to redeem his creation. Furthermore, these present successes are a very real foretaste of even greater things to come on that day when God will fully restore all that he has made. Never forget, saints of God, or never believe that you cannot witness in public places. You simply need to know what it is you are going to say to the public. These are the Christian answers to the four questions we have taken up. Does creation have a value of its own? Yes, it does, because God has called it good. Do humans have a capacity to consider creation's needs, to actually serve and protect it? Yes, they do, for they bear the image of God to it. Do they have the authority to do so? Yes, on the basis of God's word to them and the image that they bear. And do they have a hope that this works matters? Yes, because that hope arises from a resurrected Savior who is the agent and sustainer of creation, who is Jesus Christ the Lord, for whom all creation waits with us for the redemption of the world. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I give thanks for all these saints assembled before me who are here to attend to your word. I give thanks that you have made these lives. I give thanks for their intention to be disciples of your son, Jesus Christ, in a dark and disobedient world. Aid and help each one of them to accomplish that further today. I pray for myself and for them. Give to us knowledge and first-hand expression and experience of the beauty of all that you have made, that we may know it and rejoice in it and give glory to you. Give to us with this knowledge a knowledge of the suffering of your creation, which we have often caused. And give to us, O oh Lord, the power and the pathway to repent, that this might no longer be a barrier between you and us. And I pray for a path to open to each person here and to me in this work and to draw close to you in doing it. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.